Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. I'm Mark Whittington, the pastor of Evergreen Baptist Church, and I'm so glad that you are joining us tonight as we have for the last several weeks through video on our Wednesday night schedule uh, for the last uh, couple of three weeks now. On Sunday, we've been meeting together uh, in our sanctuary as well as for a couple of weeks together with that, our drive-in service now, just our 10.30 a.m. sanctuary service. So slowly beginning to get back to that uh, schedule and, and setting that we are more used to. And I hope you'll be a part of that. Uh, we're not having any other gatherings here uh, for our worship time except our Sunday morning service right now. But as the summer goes along, we'll begin adding to that and we'll be letting you know. But Right now on Sunday morning, if you are in the area, if at all possible, we would love to have you join us at 1030 right here at 107 Park Street. And you can go to our website to find out more information and the things that we're doing to try to help keep you as safe and healthy as possible. Again, during these uncertain days, that website's ebcinchrist.org. And you can uh, get a lot more information there, or you can just call us here at our office uh, or stop by and visit. We would like that. But right now, we want to study God's Word. I hope you have a copy of God's Word close by. We're going to be in Psalm 99, uh, the 99th Psalm, just the first three verses. That's what we're going to uh, spend a little time together tonight. Uh, Asking the question, and we'll not even begin to really scratch the surface of this, and it may be something that we revisit in the weeks ahead. I was actually going to uh, do a full uh, study through Psalm 99 tonight, and the, the longer I spent time in it, the more I realized we're only going to get to uh, just really the first part. So um, first three verses will begin to help us answer the question, why should I worship the Lord? Why should I worship the Lord? If you're like me, uh, sometimes you find it difficult to worship the Lord. If you're like me, sometimes you find it difficult to find things to be thankful for in light of the circumstances. If you're like me, sometimes you need a reminder of where God is, of what He does, and the way that He loves you and me so much. Well, Psalm 99 is one of the many, many places that we can go in God's Word for this reminder. In fact, that is why I stress to you so often you need to be spending consistent, consecutive time in God's Word because it is filled from page to page, not just with reminders like this, but especially with reminders like this. Why is it so important that we worship the Lord. Understanding that the, the idea, the concept of worship is, is absolute, complete, total devotion. I heard someone say one time, you worship what you love and you love what you worship. Now, you can put that into a lot of different contexts and it, uh, it can be actually a little bit frightening when you think about the things that we love the most, therefore invest the most of ourselves into. I hope and pray that uh, that's your relationship with God uh, more than anything, more than anyone else. I hope your worship, your worship focus, priority for your life is your relationship with the Lord. Well, let's spend just a few minutes together tonight as we look at the first three verses of Psalm 99 uh, asking that question and really just just, just one answer, and we'll break that answer down, but really just one of the many answers uh, to the question, why should I worship the Lord? Psalm 99, beginning in verse 1, the psalmist writes, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion and he is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you 
for the promises of your word. Thank you for the challenges of your word. Thank you for the call of your word to come before you, holy, majestic, mighty, and worship. Father, I pray tonight that you would draw us close to your heart through your word, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I said we would just look at, at one answer. Uh, sometimes I wish I had all the answers. And if we're honest, we all wish that. But then, quite often when I, when I get the answer that I thought I really wanted, I begin to realize the weight of the responsibility that comes with that answer. And I realize the most important reality is not so much knowing the answer, but knowing my God, my Creator, my Lord, my Heavenly Father, who, who knows all of the answers and who provides through every circumstance. And even if I don't know the answer, even if I don't have the answer, I can still have a great confidence in, in whatever's going on and wherever I am because I know Him. And because he is from the first to the last, the beginning to the end. And I can have a great confidence and a great strength. And as we'll see in just a while, even a great peace. Even when I don't know all the answers. And, and again, we have in these days taken so many passages of Scripture and looked at them in light of where we are right now in our culture, in our world, in our community, in our church. And we've, we, we, we've discovered that there is so much more to life than just the circumstances. There is that, that relationship that we must have, that intimate, personal relationship that we must have with God. And in that, we find a great confidence. And in that, we're able to worship no matter what the circumstances are. Now, why? why? So the, the, the question is going to come up, even in someone who's followed the Lord for a long time, the question is going to come up, why? Why should I worship the Lord? Especially when times are hard, when times are tough, when times are bad. Why? Well, the first thing we see, and that's just going to be the focus of where I want us to stay tonight in these first three verses, is simply this. We can worship the Lord because of where He is. Because of where He is. Now, we're going to look at His position from three different angles tonight. The first one is that His position has power. And that's the primary focus of the verses that we just read. We're going to look at some other passages of, of Scripture that will help us to, to flesh that out a little bit more. But His position has power power. Look back at what he says, and, and we see the, 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 uh, the evidence of this power, but it says, let the earth shake, let the peoples tremble. Where, where is the Lord? It says, the Lord reigns, in verse 1, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim. Now, where is that? Where, where is above? The, the first thought might be, well, that's heaven, right? Well, let's, let's remember, let's understand the context of an important part of reading Scripture is understanding the context in which it was written. This, this psalm is a declaration of God's faithfulness to Israel. A declaration of God's faithfulness to Israel. So we need to understand that in, in, in the context of where someone, of where a Hebrew, where, where the psalmist's initial audience, where, where their mind would have focused. And when they heard the Lord reigns, he is enthroned above the cherubim, their mind, the image, most likely in their mind would have gone to the Ark of the Covenant. You remember that sacred piece of furniture uh, that was specifically designed to be placed in the holiest of places in the tabernacle and then all, eventually in the temple? Uh, we read about it in Exodus. Uh, Exodus chapter 25 is, is one of those places where we get a real specific definition of the Ark of the Covenant. And this was the place where God said His power and His presence would come down to the people. So this was the place where all of God's presence and all of God's power would come down so that the priest 
could, uh, could have that, that as close as possible contact with Almighty God. Let's read about it. Exodus chapter 25, beginning in verse 17. The instructions were this, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give you. That's the Ten Commandments. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. This was the place of, that the presence and the power of God would come to his people, Israel. Now, the first image, uh, if you're like me, especially if you're a child of the 80s, the first image that comes to mind is Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, that's one of, of, of a thousand potential images. We don't know exactly what it looked like. And that's one of the things where we have to be really careful trying to imagine. We do have enough description to know that it was a, a, a must have been a glorious sight covered in pure gold and these angelic beings sitting on the top facing one another and the wings coming up and over in that symbol of authority and power and protection and there the presence of God would come down. The cherubim. And the psalmist writes that is one of the perspectives we need to have of God, that is where He is dwelling above or between, depending on the way your translation uh, writes it, the cherubim. His position has power. This was the place of power. This is where God spoke His commands. This is where His power was executed for the nation of Israel. Now, a problem we might have there just imagery problem again because we try to create an image we try to make a picture in our mind and say well this is what it must have looked like when we don't know we hear the word cherubim and again you might think wait a minute cherubim like those little fat baby angels cherubim I don't think so I don't think so that's that's not what a biblical cherubim I, I can assure you this that is not what a biblical cherubim looked like. Now we get different descriptions of angelic beings through the scripture and we're going to look at a couple of those right here in just a moment. But I can assure you it's not, it's not the little fat baby angels that we see uh, in contemporary artwork today. Uh, because he says uh, they are going to, the, the, the people are going to tremble, the earth is going to shake. And I just don't see those, those little guys um, causing that much um, fear and trembling. So what, 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 do, um, what do the cherubim look like or where do we see them in the Scripture? Well, the very first glimpse, if you will, that we get of a cherubim is in Genesis chapter 3. Cherubim were stationed at the entrance to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were evicted. We read it in Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. So God drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Now again, we don't know exactly what they looked like, but it was definitely an awe-inspiring, and even more than that, I would dare say a terrifying sight. Cherubim and a flaming sword. Were they holding the flaming sword? Was the flaming sword independent of them? We don't know for certain, but this was an intimidating, powerful, terrifying sight. This is the image of power that we need to have when we come to worship God. That's, that's where He is. 
He is in the position of highest, most extreme, most uncomprehensible power. You fast forward that image from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Revelation chapter 4, just kind of flip your Bible almost all the way closed. Revelation chapter 4. And listen to what John saw. Now again, we have several different descriptions of angelic images and every time they are majestic, they are powerful, and at times even terrifying. Revelation chapter 4. This is how John, this is what John saw. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like jasper stone and sardis in appearance, radiant, absolutely radiant. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. So it was not just a radiant sight, but it was a terrifying sight. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, here, here, here they are, full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had the face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders will fall down before Him who sits on the throne and will worship Him who lives forever and ever. And they will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are You, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of you, because of your will, they existed and were created. This is the worship that is going on around the throne of heaven right now and for all eternity. And it is because of the glory and the radiance and the majesty and the power of God. That is why we must worship the Lord, because where He is, is a position. It is the place of power, absolute, complete power. Now, that's not the only reason why we read in Scripture, why we should worship the Lord. If that were the case, then it would see, it would come, it, it, it would it, it would be really easy to conclude that God's just a, a big bully, and He's not. He's not. Because you see, His position is not only a place of power, but as we see in other places in the Scripture that I want us to reference here for just a few minutes to, to kind of broaden this, this answer just a little bit more, is, is His position not only has power, but it has perspective. His position has perspective. We turn over just a little bit into the book of Isaiah. Prophet's uh, record of, of God's uh, provision, but also God's judgment upon Israel because of their disobedience. And why? Why? How could He do that? Because of His perspective. Because He was aware, not just in control, but aware, could see everything. I mean, look at this description in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? 
I mean, the perspective of God is unfathomable. We don't know what God's view is like. We don't have a clue. We get minute snapshots, just fragments of images through the scriptures. But we, th there's no way until we see him face to face will we even begin to have an understanding of what God's perspective is. So because of that, I want us to, I want us to look at some of the perspectives of God's creation that we have. And I want to show you uh, a few of these. The first uh, picture that I want you to see here is the view from the International Space Station. Uh, this, this, this space station has uh, been in the news lately because of the recent launch and the astronauts that were sent to the space station. I want you to look, this picture uh, goes back just a little ways to October the 1st, 2019. It was taken by NASA astronaut Nick Haig on, uh, on, on October the 1st of uh, 2019, just before he left uh, the International Space Station after uh, staying there, after being there for six months. This, this picture from the space station is approximately, is taken from approximately 250 miles away. That's, that's what the earth looks like from 250 miles away. What an amazing view. What, what, what an, an awesome, overwhelming perspective. But we can go farther out than that. Uh, look at this next picture. Uh, this is the view uh, from Apollo 8. Now this takes us back uh, several years, back to, in fact to 1968. This was taken aboard Apollo 8 by Bill Anders on December the 24th, 1968. And this picture uh, that's called Earthrise uh, was taken uh, of the Earth as, as, they, as they orbited around uh, the moon. Uh, and this was one of the, the initial pictures that was taken of the Earth from that distance. Literally, instead of the moon rising, uh, this was the Earth rising uh, above the horizon of the moon. This picture is taken uh, from some 239,000 miles away. 239,000 miles away. This is what the Earth looks like. Uh, but we can go farther than that. We can go farther than that. Uh, look at this next picture. Uh, this next picture uh, that was taken uh, in 1990 uh, from Voyager 1, uh, a satellite that was sent out into uh, our, our part of the solar system, uh, taking pictures as it went. Basically, it was just a, a satellite with a camera on it, and, 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 every, and as it traveled further and further, it, it, it took pictures. This this is from 1990, from, from um, February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1990. The Voyager Project planned to shut off uh, the, the imaging cameras to conserve power for a period of time because the probe uh, would not fly close to any other objects to take pictures before the shutdown. The mission then commanded the probe to basically start turning around and take a series of 60 images designed to produce what they termed the family portrait of the solar system. And this, like I said, was executed on Valentine's Day of 1990. And this sequence returned images for making color views of six of the solar system's planets and also imaged the sun in monochrome. But as they began to study these pictures, they noticed a little speck, what was referred to as the pale blue dot. And they realized this was Earth from 3.7 billion miles away. This is what the Earth looks like from 3.7 billion miles away. Wow, what a perspective. One more picture. Look at this one. And no, you'll not see the Earth in this picture because it's actually pointing away. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, back uh, again in, in my growing up days, this, this massive, uh, amazing, technologically advanced telescope was, was launched uh, into space. And this 
is a picture referred to as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field 2014 image. It is a composite of multiple pictures taken from 2003 to 2012 with the advanced camera system that the Hubble had. And astronomers had, had studied these pictures uh, for a while in invisible and near infrared light in a series of images uh, that had been captured over several years. And, and it shows a small section, this is just a small section of space in the southern hemisphere constellation known as Fornax. But now, using ultraviolet light, astronomers were able to combine the full range of colors available to Hubble, stretching all the way from ultraviolet to near-infrared light. And this resulting image, which uh, NASA writes is made from 841 orbits of telescope viewing time, listen to this, this image contains approximately 10,000 galaxies. 10,000 galaxies. And just as they said, a small section of space in our southern hemisphere. Perspective. Perspective. Now, with all of that in mind, if this is what we can see, how much more can God see? Let me ask that again. If this is what we can see, how much more does God see? Why should I worship the Lord? Because His position not only has power, but it has perspective. So much more perspective than you and I do. I must worship Him. One more. Not only does His position have power and perspective, but His position also, as the Scripture reminds us in many places, His, His position gives peace. His position gives peace. Back in Psalms, Psalm 34, verse 18, sums it up this way. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He can see all of creation of all the universe, yet He is near the brokenhearted and the one who is crushed in spirit. He saves. That's peace. That's peace. That's perfect peace. And... And as much as I may want to understand it, the, the peace of God does not always provide an explanation. God does not have to explain Himself to me as much as I want Him to so many times. In fact, the promise of God's peace that we read throughout the New Testament, the promise of God's peace actually takes into consideration my limited understanding of the circumstances. Maybe one of the best places to, to begin to take this in is in Paul's letter to the Philippians. This prison letter. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Here it is, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Even when I can't understand, and maybe especially when I can't understand, I still can have peace. Why? Because that's where God is. God is not just in a position of power. He's not just in a position of, of absolute perspective, but He is in a position to give you and me peace, perfect peace, even in uncertain times. Even in painful times, even when I do not understand, look back at verse 3 in the original text that we read. How, what, what, what is our response? How do we respond? 
we respond with worship. Verse 3, let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is He. Thirty-seven-year-old housewife, Annie Hawks. Back in the, in the 1800s, I can tell you exactly when it was, 1872. 1872, 37 year old housewife. We think of hymn writers, we don't think of 37 year old housewives. We think of uh, women or men who had lived long, difficult, troublesome lives, wrote hymns through the inspiration of those trials and tribulations. Annie Hawks was just a 37 year old, busy housewife. And one day, her need for the power and the presence and the peace of God just overwhelmed her. And she sat down and she began to write how that would be expressed, how, that, how, how she would acknowledge and, and express that to God, not knowing the impact that these words would one day make in her own life and in the lives of countless others. For you see, some 15 years after she wrote these words, her husband died. And what she had written 15 years prior took on a whole new meaning. Here's what she wrote. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee every hour, in joy or in pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is in vain. I need thee every hour, teach me thy will. Thy promises so rich in me fulfill. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. Sometimes later, Robert Lowry wrote the refrain, I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Even in uncertain times, even in painful times, even when I do not understand, I must worship the Lord. He is in a position of power. He has ultimate, perfect perspective. And He provides complete peace. Let's pray. Father, that's exactly what we need right now. That is so much what we need right now. And I pray that wherever we are, each and every one who's a part of this Bible study time tonight or sometime later, pray we would realize the power and the perspective and the peace that you are able to bring into our lives when we trust you, when we come to that place of absolute, total, complete surrender to you. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much that there is no situation, there is no circumstance, there is uh, there, there, no event that is outside of your control or beyond your understanding. And Lord, for Weeks now we have been asking for your care and for your direction and your wisdom in our world, in our communities, for the last several days in our country, Lord, even now in recent days in our own church family, circumstances that seem overwhelming and out of control. Lord, we need you. We need you. 
every moment of every hour of every day. Yes, right here, right now, we continue to ask for your mercy across our land and around this world as, as we still wrestle to, to gain an understanding and a, and, and a, and a, and a direction in, in this, the whole situation with the COVID-19 virus pandemic. Lord, thank you that, there, that, that strides are being made, that the discoveries are being made. That thank you for the wisdom and the direction you are giving so many to treat this, this deadly virus. Yes, Lord, we, we ask for your mercy in our land in these days with all of the, the division and the unrest and the anger and the bitterness and the rage that's being expressed and the prejudice that is so real in our hearts. Oh, Lord, come and teach us how to love others as you first loved us. Yes, Lord, in our church family. We ask for your, for your peace and for your power to be made known. So many we could call by name, but in our own church family, so specifically right now, we pray for, for Jackson Conway. Lord, for the very serious health needs that he has. And as so many have asked, we ask again for your healing. We ask for your mercy, for your grace. We ask for your strength and your wisdom for him, for his family, for those who are caring for him. And as you have already been in so many ways, we also continue to ask that you would be glorified and you would be honored and lifted up through his life and through this journey. And Lord, these, these three images that I've just mentioned here are representative, representative of so many more. So let us not stop here. Lord, keep us so close to your heart that our attitude and conversation of prayer would be constant, never-ending. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for, for hearing us. Thank you for knowing exactly who we are. Lord, thank you for knowing exactly what we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you so much for being a part of our time tonight, uh, Bible study together. Uh, let me mention uh, something that's coming up tomorrow night, uh, Thursday night, uh, downtown Evergreen in the area they call No Man's Land. They're going to have a, uh, a prayer vigil, uh, not only for Jackson, but for another uh, young cancer patient as well, specifically praying uh, for, uh, for Eric uh, Turner. And uh, you're, you're invited to come. It's going to be at 7 o'clock. Uh, downtown Evergreen. Uh, so you, uh, if, if you can do that, you come for that time of prayer together with our community. Uh, our youth, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, our youth have been gathered right now while we've been sharing this time together, uh, praying as well uh, in our sanctuary. And speaking of that, I hope that you would be able to be with us uh, this upcoming Sunday at 10.30 a.m., gathering in our sanctuary for a great time of worship and celebration together. If there's any way that we can uh, minister especially to you, please let us know. Please stay in contact with us. So, several different ways that you can do that. And we would love to hear from you and love to stay, be connected with you and stay connected with you. And uh, we hope to see you really soon. God bless you.